Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It's nine o'clock, which means it's time for a talk magic. And today I have a gentleman with me that has revolutionized the magic industry. And I don't just, there's very few people that have done what this gentleman has done, literally revolutionized an aspect of magic and taken it in a completely different direction. His creations have are used by professional magicians all over the world. And it's just incredible i'm hoping he gives some insights into how this all came to be i'm super excited to have him on the channel i am of course talking about the one and only the legend himself greg rastami how you doing greg you okay i'm doing great thank you hi hi craig thank you so much for having me this is exciting man thank you so much for coming on the channel i know that you're always busy i know that you're always planning something with uh, rastami magic and and you've always got a million projects on so Oh, yeah. um the the fact that you found time to come and, and chat to me i really appreciate it sure no no seriously like i said it's, it's my pleasure i'm really happy to be here with you you're so passionate about magic uh and i love the interviews that you do and so yeah <laughs> and and i have to tell people before we start this interview the other day i was in a hotel room because i'd been performing away and i had a phone call from greg who proceeded to then whilst i was on the phone with him read my mind for like 10 minutes and just absolutely blow my mind. Uh, d d just doing stuff that I couldn't even imagine how it could be done if you were in the room with me, let alone hundreds and hundreds of miles away. So we'll get to that a little bit later on and, 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 and what that was all about. But yeah, you're, you're, you fool me over and over again. It's just fantastic. But what I want to do, Greg, is I want to uh, talk about everything, including what you've become known for uh, recently, which is obviously apps. But I think for anybody who doesn't know you or doesn't know your career, I think we give them a bit of a frame of reference first of all. Can I ask about your origin story? When did you get into magic? How did that all come to be? Yeah, I started doing magic when I was really young, uh, probably about 10 years old. And my dad got me a Svengali deck and uh, I was, you know, the magic bug had bitten me at that time. Um, I had seen a few magicians and later on as I was getting older, um, I, I saw a magician that was in a bar mitzvah that like really just um, completely blew me away. And I fell in love with the whole art form and I wanted to be just like this guy, <laughs> you know? So I, I pursued it even further. Um, and that was like really the beginnings of it. And I started doing magic at, at an early age, actually professionally, which was really fun. Um, I worked at Hollywood Magic here in Los Angeles, which is one of the um, oldest magic shops in the world. And um, unfortunately, it's closed down now, but uh, that was an amazing time with working with some of the legends in magic. Um, and then from there on, you know, it was just like life took over. I didn't perform magic as professionally. And then like about 13 years ago, I decided to... Uh, make a magic app with a good friend of mine, Randy Croucher, who is a, a developer, an app developer. Um, and that's actually when iForce got started. Hang so, on a minute. Can we just rewind a little bit here? So up until 13 years ago, you'd left magic for a while. Yes. Oh, wow. So before we talk about iForce, can I ask, what, what, you know, you were working in a magic shop as a kid and you were doing, you were working at Holly. So you're obviously passionate about magic. Yes, very. Uh, you, but what made you kind of move away from it? You know, because obviously you mentioned professional magic. You'd done gigs, I imagine. What made you kind of move away? And more importantly, what made you decide to come back? Yeah, uh, I was very passionate about the visual effects industry. And so um, I was studying visual effects. And um, I, I also was really involved in computer science and electrical engineering. And so there was all these other things that I was doing. And uh, as I, you know, left, you know, working at Hollywood Magic, I actually started working for the second largest visual effects facility in the world. That's here in Simi Valley um, uh, called DreamQuest. And I did visual effects uh, for wow. almost a decade, you know, with a, a variety of different uh, visual effects companies. And I actually have film credits in IMDb. So if anybody <laughs> looks up my name in IMDb, you'll find me there with the various film credits that I have. Um, but but yeah, that that became my quote unquote day job. 
you know? Uh, and then at the same time, you know, I was involved in the development of 3D animation software. And I was working with a company called Hash Incorporated, um, just, you know, representing their products and um, selling their products at trade shows. And um, along the way, I picked up a, a couple of patents and image processing with my sister. Um, so just, you know, I was involved so much in the technology world in, you know, software development, image processing, visual effects. And that, you know, at the same time, I always had my passion for magic was always there. And I was always involved, you know, as much as I could be with magic, um, trying so to perform we, magic. Yeah. So were you still practicing during this layoff period? Were you still kind yeah. of like oh, yeah. studying oh, yeah, and practicing? Yeah. And But it became just a hobby at that point. You weren't creating. You had no aspirations right. to perform. It was really just a hobby. And, and, that, and that was yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, as a matter of fact, it's kind of interesting. It's just because... Um, I was constantly doing magic and I was also constantly creating magic, but I was never considering doing it professionally as far as like um, selling any of the things that I had created. Um, and I made a trick called Stuck. At, at first I made a first trick, it was called Cosmos, uh, which later on turned into Cosmos 2, which is an out of this world uh, effect. But uh, I decided actually that I was gonna venture into trying to sell it. So I first sold Cosmos, um, released Stuck, reached out to Murphy's, and uh, Murphy's was really interested in carrying Stuck, and so they did, and they made the, the DVD for it and everything. Um, and so that kind of like got my attention. And so, you know what, you know, I have a passion for magic, and it looks like I can make some money, actually, <laughs> you know, making magic and selling it, you know, which is wonderful. Um, and that just kept going. And so when the iPhone became available, um, I was investigating creating hardware, actually electronics hardware for magic. Um, and I soon realized that would, that was going to be like too complicated of a project. But what was great about the iPhone was that it had um, all this magical technology. In it. Like, for example, it had an accelerometer, you know, and it obviously had a screen. And so I thought about how can I organically use these features for uh, a magic utility that in the case of iForce would be a multiple out system, you know, that would take advantage of the accelerometer that was in the, in, on the phone. Um, and, and that's really where iForce was born from, was just me kind of looking at a hardware project and realizing I couldn't really build the hardware um, you know, inexpensively or without a lot of effort being thrown into it so that software would be an easier path to pursue. And hence, I reached out to my buddy, Randy, and we made iForce, and that was 2009. Wow. And I, that was one of the first Magic apps, wasn't it? I mean, the, 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 that was one of the first apps. I remember it being one of the very first apps I bought. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah and I remember it just... Well, I mean, I still have it on my phone to this day. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it, it, multiple outs are such an incredible principle, an incredible tool in magic, but normally it can be quite cumbersome. But here now you've got a situation where you go, well, I'm just going to put something on my phone. And then when you pick it up, you've got the right thing. I mean, it's it was used by a lot of people. But back then, I think that people were more skeptical towards apps than they are today. Yes. Did, did you see? So I, I remember. Yeah, I, I latched onto apps very early on, and I remember people oh. saying to me, "Oh, everybody's going to know it's to do with the phone. Why are you bothering with that? You know, that's not real magic." Blah 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 blah. Did you <laughs> right. did, did right. you find that in the early days compared to now, and did that yeah. affect? I don't know sales or anything, or was everybody very open at the at the very beginning? How did oh. how did you get past that? Yeah, yeah, there, there's always been these two camps in the magic community, the, the community that embraces using apps or phones at, as something that's ubiquitous that everybody's using and, and doing things that are clever with it. Um, and then there's the camp that is just very much against it. And they don't want to in any way do it. And exactly based on what you said, you know, because of what you said, mm -hmm. you know, that it, isn't the technology going to take credit for the magic that's being done. Um, and I disagree with that. You know, there, there's aspects of it that I agree with, but there's many aspects of it that I disagree with, mainly because um, I'm living proof that after 13 years of performing app magic, you get some of the world's most amazing reactions from doing app magic correctly. And like any other magic um, utility, there's going to be people that are going to use it poorly, 
you know, or perform with it poorly. And there's other people that are great performers that are going to use it in a clever way to get incredible reactions and create wonder. Yeah, I, so, I completely agree. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's really what it's all about. And um, I've heard of many people that lecture uh, about multiple outs and they use iForce as a, you know, one of the possible technologies of how you can have multiple outs, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, and, and one thing I loved about, about iForce is you had so many different ideas with it. It wasn't just like, here's an app, this is what you do, end of project, that's it. It was like, well, here's what you can do with this, and now here's how you use it, and this is another idea of using it. And it was just like, wow, this, this person has really thought things through. You know, it's, it's, and, and it's that added value that I think really personifies a lot of the products that you bring to market. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, what I wanted to do always was to create utilities that magicians would be able to customize any way they wanted. You know, that was, uh, there were two, there's two factors that identified Rostami Magic for me. The first one is um, making effects that are fast. You know, I wasn't really interested in doing any effects that were going to be long-winded, even though I think that long-winded effects are beautiful, but I wanted something that would produce a very fast effect because I was thinking about a restaurant worker or somebody who is doing walk around magic or even a casual performer that just wants to do something really, really fast and be done with the effect. Uh, and at the same time, it had to be fooling. Um, and, and more importantly, it had to be a utility item so that at any time you wanted to customize it, you can instantly customize it so that it can do something totally different than what you had done before with it, you know, and that's, really been the essence of every product that I've made is, can I make this into a general purpose utility? Mm. Yeah. And over time, I realized that the biggest elephant in the room was the fact that the magic was happening on my farm, right? And that was the, the weakness of all of this stuff. And so I started really quickly deviating away from my phone and um, thinking about how can you make the same exact thing happen on a spectator's phone. And yeah, before, go ahead. Before we get into that, because obviously you're now moving into inject and other, other, other areas. Right, before right. we get there, can I ask a question? Where, sure. How did we get from releasing iForce to founding Rastami Magic? And yeah, what yeah. I mean by that is because obviously you said you'd taken a break from magic, you're still practicing, you, you know, went to Murphy's with a particular trick, but you kind of felt that you came back into the community with the release of iForce, which was resoundingly well received and everybody loved it. Yeah. How, you know, at that point, were you thinking, right, I'm back. I could make a career out of this, uh, doing this sort of thing. This is a niche that not many people are actually operating in. And I've got this product that's like a big jumping off board. Or, or was it like, okay, that was nice. Now, now I'm going to go back to visual effects. Like, how did we get from <laughs> iForce to Rastami Magic? Yeah. Um, so iForce was the start of Rostami Magic. And so once I realized that the community had embraced this idea, um, the best thing that I could have done was to continue, you know? And mm -hmm. I had a lot of other ideas that, about things that I wanted to do. And it was just a matter of then, you know, reaching out to uh, Randy and finding time uh, to, at, in the middle of the night, you know, constantly developing and creating these products that led to, believe it or not, I've made 22 apps on both platforms, both iOS and Android. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, most people don't know that, that I've made so many apps, but I have. You know, some, some of the apps that I've made um, have been made specifically for companies that, um, that I made for like advertising purposes for companies. But, but yeah, in these you know, 13 years, I've made a lot of product. Um, and I wish that all these products actually could be supported all the time. And that's something else that's difficult about app development is how do you keep it, keep it all up? Because when you make something physical, like, okay, I got it. I made this thing and it just works, <laughs> you know, and you sell it to people and, and you're done. Whereas app development and app magic means that every time somebody changes an operating system, I got to go do fix it. And things break all the time that I did not break, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. that's that's difficult. Um, but 
since Rastami Magic has been profitable, um, it, it's my duty and my responsibility and my pleasure actually to support the community and to make sure that everybody is going to have a tool that they can rely on that's going to work all the time. And yeah. that's right now my number one goal because we have a lot of customers and I want all of my customers to be happy. That's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, so going back to our, so we've released iForce. Mm -hmm. You kind of have in your mind, well, the weakness here is it's taking place on my phone. Was the what was the next thing that you went down? Was it Inject? Because Inject really was something that changed the game in the industry. Really, when I alluded oh, yeah, to you changing yeah. the game, that was you know Inject was a big part of that. Yeah, no, uh, immediately the, the next item that was on the list was iPredict and iPredict Plus. And, and the idea behind iPredict was basically calling Mr. Wizard. Uh, and I thought, okay, calling Mr. Wizard has been this premise in magic forever. How can I bring that into the 21st century? And uh, the, the idea behind that was that if I use the contacts app and somebody just simply looks at a contact and calls the phone number, and if the voicemail reveals their chosen card or chosen number or whatever. This is a way of revealing a spectator's thought that's happening on their phone using a phone call, which is what the purpose of a phone is, to make a phone call, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and so that's, that's really was the beginning of moving away from my phone being the center of attention, you know, where my phone was actually being used nothing more than um, a contact list where somebody just had a contact and I was showing them the phone number. I'm like, just call that person right there, which happens to be the method, actually. <laughs> you know, that's great. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. And that's that was a, that was as well received as iForce. And yeah, it, yeah. Um, Theory Eleven carried that. Yeah, it was received actually wow. pretty well. It wasn't wasn't received as big as iForce mainly because iForce was like the first and had such a huge push. You know. But yeah, it still did pretty well. Um, yeah, and along the way, between like iForce and Inject, um, there were uh, other products that I did that relied on my phone. You know, like for example, I did a product called iTeleConnect, which was based on the proximity sentence sensor and vibrations on the phone, which is really neat. It was a very different idea than like mm. mentalism kind of apps that I had been doing, you know. Um, so yeah, I did a, magician, a trick called Dead Magician, which was based on the same idea that I predict was, but it was around the theme of um, really dark Halloween, scary kind of a reveal in a mm. voicemail that's from a dead magician, <laughs> you know? So yeah, a ton of stuff. Yeah, there was just all these things that led up to um, where I started investigating internet-based magic. And, and that was actually in 2013. So Basically from 2009 up to 2013, I was in the world of my phone and making phone calls and vibrating a phone and things like that. You know, whereas then I said, okay, uh, what if I could you know, investigate things that are just tied to the internet? And, and the product I released in 2013 was called Telephoto. Um, and, and Telephoto was huge um, just because it kind of harkened back to products that uh, Craig Filsetti releases with ProMystic, mm -hmm. where a, a spectator makes a selection and the magician gets some kind of a vibration pattern, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. And so I wanted to do something that was like that, but was on uh, in, in, in the realm of phones, you know, yeah. where a spectator opens up a web page where there's an album of a variety of different selections and they make it selection and the magician can't see it, can't hear it or nothing, but the magician knows what photo the spectator is looking at, you know? And uh, that really was the beginnings of Inject, was this whole thing where the spectator's phone on a browser is acting like a transmitter, and I, my phone, is acting like a receiver of some sort. <laughs> you know which is uh, i mean where did i mean obviously as you said this is the precursor to uh to inject where did you come up with that idea was it seeing uh craig filicetti stuff and going well hang on a minute i can bring this away from uh sort of thumpers and bring it into a more organic object uh, where, where did you get the inspiration to, the to inspiration, come up with this? Uh, i i remember seeing um 
Well, Craigfield Studies products was a big inspiration, you know, and uh, recognizing that, okay, you know, you can use radio signals to transmit information, in, you know, in a certain distance, but the advantage that the internet would give you was that there is no distance barrier as long as I'm connected to the internet and somebody else is connected to the internet, they can be anywhere in the world and I can still receive wireless signals from them, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so uh, so that that was yeah. So Craig Felsetti's products was a big inspiration. Um, there was somebody that had a product, um, I believe, it was on either on Android or iOS that was doing something that was based on a remote transmission of information. And I was like, okay, that's interesting, but you know, I want to be able to really build on this idea to make it be a utility, where a machine could go in and say, all these images that are here are going to be images that I want, you know. So if it, it allows the magician to customize an effect that's going to be for them yeah. and not just something that's a canned effect. You know, I wanted to constantly, as I said before, make utilities that would allow you to do whatever you wanted to do and not what was just built into the product. Um, and then and that was it. Yeah. And that's really the inspiration of how these things came about. And along wow. the way, yeah. And along the way, once I realized that I can receive information from the spectator. I'm like, okay, well, why, why don't I make like a general purpose thumper? You know, the same way that, uh, <laughs> you know, oops, excuse me for a second. Just, thank you, thank you. <laughs> why don't I make something that's gonna be, <laughs> that, that was my wife. <laughs> You've got service as well. This is amazing, <laughs> the best thing for you ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I thought about, you know, hey, as, as long as I can receive information from the spectator, why not try, try to transmit information, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I knew that magicians use ways of transmitting information like thumpers, you know, electronic thumpers. And I'm like, well, you know, it's a phone. I might as well use that. And so I released a product right after Telephoto that was called Super Thump. And mm -hmm. that probably is the closest product to inject that I made. Um, and in Super Thump, there was a feature that was called the Web Thumper. And uh, there was a fam very famous um, television magician who got interested in that idea and, you know, bought the television performance rights from me. And he essentially stopped me from further developing the, the web development or the, the web thumping aspects of Super Thump for a couple of years. So I couldn't really do anything more with it. I was kind of stuck just because of the, the business deal that we had together. Um, so in essence, Inject would have really come out in like 2014 or literally 2015, but that didn't happen. <laughs> you know, we had to wait until like 2016, 17, actually for it to come to fruition. That must have been frustrating for you. If you knew where you wanted to take your, this concept that you've developed, you knew yeah. you wanted to take it, especially now we're talking about 2014, 2015, app magic is starting to catch on. Mm -hmm. More people are starting to use apps. More people are developing apps. Were you a bit worried? Well, I can't do anything else with this for two years. What happens yeah. if somebody sees this that I've done and takes that creative leap instead of me? Yes. Yeah, that did actually happen. And that, that was a, a big concern of mine. Um, where I knew that I had competition and I knew that there is a limited number of good ideas, <laughs> you know, and that other developers would exploit these ideas that were just organically and naturally there for the taking. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, that really, really bothered me a lot. And that did that actually did happen with a, a variety of other uh, app developers that came up with things that were similar to what I was working on. Right. Uh, to be but very still, yeah okay okay so you then was that did you create any apps in that two-year period or yes 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 inject actually was created in that two-year period so right. what what we ended up doing and in, in, in this case we is Hanny Nagib and I so Hanny is the the programmer of inject um, Hanny and I looked at the general architecture that we had set up for Super Thump and was like, you know what? Um, what other kinds of effects can we build for this universe with this foundation of the internet is acting like a transmitter and a receiver, you know? Um, and there was a ton of ideas. Um, and we threw all those ideas together and came up with basically what people now know as Inject. 
And, and for those people who have been living under a rock and have <laughs> no idea what Inject is, can you describe it? Would that be okay? Yes, absolutely. What is Inject? Inject is an app that runs both on iOS and Android, and it allows you to convert your phone into either a secret transmitter or into a secret receiver, you know? So as a receiver, um, one of the prominent things that people do with Inject is that they have a spectator go to Google and do a search for something. And uh, the magician immediately knows what the spectator has done a search for in Google. Um, and so that's where the magician is receiving information from the spectator's phone, um, unbeknownst to the spectator. And the other way around is when, you know, the magician is transmitting something to the spectator's phone. And one of the popular tricks in Inject in, in that regard is um, on the spectator phone, the spectator opens up a photograph of Houdini that they're looking at throughout the whole time. They name any card in the deck of cards. And when they zoom in on the eyes of Houdini, inside the eyes, the reflections of the eyes actually reveal the card that they just named or they pick from a deck of cards, wow. you know? So in that, in that particular example, what's happening is that the spectator's phone is like a receiver, you know, that's receiving information secretly from me while I, the magician, am the transmitter. Yeah. So that's, that's really, in essence, what Inject is. <laughs> and yeah. to, by, the, by the way, to, to the spectator, it seems like the magician has absolutely nothing. You know, like if you ever watch me perform, you'll notice that I don't even have like a smartwatch on my wrist. I have nothing. You know, my sleeves are rolled up and I'm just like standing there, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and all these amazing things are happening. I'm reading their mind and things are appearing in Houdini's eyes and blah, 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 <laughs> you know. So, yeah. Man. Okay. So uh, this, this, a couple of things I want to, I want to ask you about with regards to inject. First of all, sure. you mentioned at the very beginning when you talked about inject, it's developed for both Android and Apple, which yes. is a big deal because a lot of the apps that come out these days are really just Apple centric. Yes. And you're one of the few developers that develop for both Apple and Android. Mm -hmm. Why do you think so many apps are only developed for Apple? And why did you take that decision to um, develop for both platforms? Um, yeah, I wanted the products to be available for everybody, you know, regardless of what the platform was. I mean, the, the challenge is how do you develop for both platforms without going broke in actually having two different code bases, you know, and not having any time to sleep. So the solution to that problem is um, development environments that are cross-platform. And at the time that we started doing, for example, Telephoto, um, there were products that were just coming out that allowed developers to actually write only one piece of code and cross compile both for iOS and Android. As a matter of fact, you, would, uh, you could actually cross compile it for any of the platforms that were available at that time, including Microsoft's phone as well, which no longer exists today. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so if we wanted to release for literally any platform that was available in the world, we could have at that time. Um, and so that's, that's a decision that we made really early on was to say, you know what, we need to address the entire market as a whole. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, the Android marketplace was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, to only focus on iOS would have been a bad business idea, you know. Yeah, and, and I know that, you know, a lot of app developers, you know, for example, you know, Mark Kirsten that only focuses on iOS has been very successful with that. And I applaud that. And, and there's a tremendous amount of advantage in doing apps only for one particular operating system. It, it gives you a lot of control. Um, but at the same time, you know, being cross-platform makes my customers happy because now just because they chose to be on an Android, <laughs> they'd have to say, darn it, I can't get this for my phone because it's not supported. My phone is not supported. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So one thing that I've noticed with Inject is, you know, a lot of apps that get bought out, you, you bought Inject out in 2017, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. It's not sooner. <laughs> yeah, so it's like almost five years now that yes. Inject has been out. And a lot of apps have like a, not all apps, but there's a lot of apps that have like a, I don't want to say limited lifespan, but, you know, you see, you see some apps that come out and everyone's using them and then a month or two later or a year later, they've kind of fallen by the wayside. Inject has always, has continued to be 
the app that everybody uses like all of the time why is that do you think why is it that you've had that sustainability that you've had this app for five years and there's lots of other apps that have come out in the meantime but inject is still right up there as one of the best apps you can buy it's kind of like i kind of think of it i kind of think now of uh inject a little bit like the invisible deck uh, and what i mean by that is when you first get into magic and you go well, you know what i'm gonna i want to do card tricks can someone recommend a good gimmick pack of cards yeah you got to get the invisible deck that's where <laughs> you start the invisible deck with app magic you know there's certain apps that are recommended uh some of mark's apps you know digital force bag wiki test but the sure. one that comes up again and again and again and again and again is inject yes so why why has it had that sustainability over the over the last five years yeah. Uh, two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that Inject is financially successful, <laughs> you know, which means it makes money. So if it makes money, that means that I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure whatever comes in, I turn it around and I put it back out into the community, you know, so that I can constantly maintain it. Uh, that's very, very important. And, and that's actually the reason why, like when I, whenever I see fellow app developers come up with products and they fall off. It's not because that magician is being lazy or anything else like that. It's just simply because the product didn't make money, you know, and, and the, all the work that goes into maintaining these products is hard, you know, and that's why at the end of the day, you just kind of like have to cut it off. Um, and, and I am actually uh, a victim of that as well. I mean, I've made products that I have not been able to update just because they were not successful. And I want to be able to go back and, you know, re revive those products, but it just takes time and effort. And then the other reason why Inject has been so successful and the reason why people keep coming back to it and, you know, calling it like the, the Swiss Army knife of magic is because it was designed actually to be that. Um, I wanted Inject to be so powerful to the point where almost no one would be able to come up with something different other than Inject, you know? Mm. And that might seem very presumptuous or <laughs> that might lack modesty, <laughs> but I, that was the design, you know? I said, you know, what can I do that is so powerful that you could practically, practically build any effect that you want with it? you know um and that's it and 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 we did and we, we built something that is this powerful that is so flexible and versatile yeah and and when people really learn it they just keep applying it every day to different kinds of effects yeah mm -hmm. by the way that's both a, that's both a positive and a negative okay the positive nature of that is that when you build kind of like um a Lego set, which is essentially what, you know, Inject is, is you put it together in any way you want. Um, it has the advantage of it being versatile, but the disadvantage is, is that it becomes daunting. It becomes overwhelming. So sometimes people, look, people open Inject and like, oh my God, what is this? <laughs> you know, uh, and that's probably the biggest flaw of my product is that it just overwhelms customers, even though I try to do everything in my power to create videos for them to uh, see my performances or see explanations and all that still it's not a one trick pony mm -hmm. you know where you just open up a product says here's the effect here's the explanation we're done <laughs> you yeah. know yeah it's not that yeah so yeah it's that double edged sword of absolutely one thing that i've also noticed about inject is a, a lot of other apps and things that take place they 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 link up to inject don't they like inject works with which is super smart greg super smart because now you've got other app companies that want to work with you because th their stuff is linking up to you and you know i know that lots of people have bought something else inject has been mentioned and so they've bought inject off the back of buying that because it makes that <laughs> product better like was that by done by design was that a bloody genius idea of yours you know because no, no. It, it, it's done two things it's 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 extended like the, the 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 marketplace or the user base massively, and now rather than just people finding about Inject, you've got other companies that are like basically marketing the Inject for you. It's ridiculously smart. Yeah, it, it speaks a lot about how 
there is kind of like this core that Inject is all about, you know? Mm-hmm. And this, this, this core is this ability of communicating information across the internet. You know, being able to use Google as a transmitter of information, like like for example, recently a product came out um, that allows a, a Google search to appear in a video, and it's absolutely brilliant. You know, and and when the developer looks at, okay, wouldn't it be great if a spectator did a Google search for whatever they wanted to, and suddenly I have a video where I'm holding a notepad and I write something down on it, and when I turn it around, whatever they had done a Google search for it is written on that notepad. <laughs> you know, and it looks perfect. And, and sure enough, that's exactly what these developers think. Like, well, why would I invest the time and the effort in creating the Google end of it when Greg's already done that work? You know, yeah. uh, or why would I invest in any kind of the, the backbone of internet communications that can happen between things when Inject already has this kind of a backbone that's there and has opened it up? You know, so. Yeah, uh, it was never a design thought. Or never, it, I, I didn't really plan it to be this way, but it was more of, I knew that the foundation of it had to be something that other things, meaning our own products, would, could easily plug into it, you know? So, yeah. yeah, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Now, Thank a you. lot of people that have developed such an incredible popular app would be resting on their laurels, but not you. You you then use the uh, popularity of Inject to catapult you to even bigger uh, uh, concepts and apps, and you continue to create apps. Was the next one that came out Realist? Yeah, yeah. So the Realist was right after Inject, and uh, with Realist, what I wanted to do was create a product that would be a lot more focused you know, mm-hmm. on one particular kind of effect. And uh, Realist comes from an idea that actually was introduced in Inject, which was called the Stanford List. And the Stanford List was a, a simple effect where you have 12 items that are on the list and you show it to the specta- on the spectator's phone. And you say that um, the Stanford psychology department determined that people didn't have a free choice whenever they would look at a list like this. And you ask the spectator to name any number between, and you first make a prediction on a piece of paper that you give to the spectator. You say, give me any number between one and 12. Spectator says three, you're like, everybody says three, open up the paper. And when they go to three on the list, they see that item number three says pizza. And when they open up the prediction, the prediction says pizza. Okay, so that was the idea that was in Inject and under the Stanford list preset. And I always thought uh, when I first made that preset, even in the instruction video, I said, well, you don't have to limit it to 12 items. You can do anything you want. You know? If you wanted to do 50 items, 100 items, whatever. And it could be anything you want it to be. Um, so I wanted to elaborate on this idea because the foundational forcing utility that you have there is the spectator recognizes that they could have freely chosen any number. you know, mm. uh, and, and therefore, there it is. And so again, I wanted to make that happen on a spectator's phone. And so I thought to myself, what is the most organic place in the internet world where lists exist? And I was like, Google, Google's trends website. You know. So then at that point, it became the chore of figuring out how do we make this look and feel exactly like trends.google.com which would be the most organic place where you would find a list of things. And that's actually the reason why a realist is called realist because it's a real list. Yeah. (laughs) And obviously the genius part of this is that it can all be done on the spectator's phone. Right. Yes. Which is is just so brilliant that it can be done on the spectator's phone and you don't even need to be there. And when I said at the beginning of the uh, interview, you rang me up and spent 15 minutes blowing my mind. That was, <laughs> with, that was with realists. That was, realist, yeah. and, 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 you know, it's so powerful, Greg, that you can now do a, you know, as a professional magician who is constantly making phone calls to clients that I need to seal the deal with, having the ability to say, Hey, have you got a phone with you? Can I show you something? Rather than just trying to say, look at my showreel, I'm good. It's more of a case <laughs> of, you know, I'm going to prove to you right now on this phone call that I'm good. And, and, and grab your phone. I'm going to show you something that's going to blow your mind. 
Right. Game changer. Game changer. Yeah. yeah. I, that's one of the biggest things that I love about Realist is performing it over the phone. And uh, as a matter of fact, when I first came up with it, I was calling people left and right, <laughs> just having a phone conversation with them and performing them. Um, Murphy's did a, uh, a video where I'm performing it while I'm driving. And the reason why we did that video is because when I first released Realist, actually, I was performing it often while I was driving, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is the greatest thing in the world. You, know, you, you tell a magician, you're going to do an absolutely amazing trick anywhere. And as a matter of fact, you can even perform it while you're driving the car, <laughs> right? <laughs> With like practically no effort. And that's, that's exactly what it is. And, and you can. So that's, I think, uh, why Realist is so powerful. And, and that you, that's something that makes Realist very unique in that ability of doing it just over an audio communication. You know? Wow. And obviously you then made Realist link up with um uh you made realist link yeah link, link link all of your apps link together so they can go seamlessly from realist into um in, into inject and and, and like yes. it, it, which is what you did on the phone to me which is just again incredible because you can be on the phone to them and you're doing this wonderful demonstration of uh, you know lists and google um uh, you know google trends and then all of a sudden you're getting them to search for something on google and you're telling them it's just ridiculous yeah, thank you. Um, to give credit where credit is due, the, the inject linking idea was created by a friend of mine in Las Vegas. And for life of me, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now. <laughs> Hopefully later on, I'll come up with, it, with, with his name. But yeah, he mentioned it and I thought it was really a great idea. Uh, I think that the reason why this whole linking thing works as well as it does is because Realist has a mechanism of pairing with a spectator's phone which is very unique and very, very invisible to the spectator, where the spectator doesn't even know that I have now secretly paired with their phone just by me asking them to follow the instructions of what I'm asking them to do. So that was a really, really big deal of, you know, examining uh, when, when Matt Radulik and I were looking at all the different ways that um, the magician can actually pair with the spectator's phone. I came up with that idea. I'm like, you know what? This is, I think, the most powerful way of pairing with a spectator's phone that's never been done before. And when we implemented it, it was solid as a rock. Um, I've performed with it now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And it's just, it just flies by everyone. And, and magicians always ask me, how did you ever pair with me? And I'm like, yeah. And I, once I explained it to them, I'm like, wow, <laughs> I would have never thought. That's incredible. Yeah. You know, Craig, I, there, there's something that I wanted to mention to you, which um, I've oftentimes talked about and I've lectured on, which um, I want the magic community to recognize about app magic and how it's different from traditional magic performances. Mm -hmm. um, whenever I do, let's say, for example, a Google Peak effect, if the person that I'm performing for does not know that I'm a magician, I don't present it like I'm doing a magic trick for them because there are no traditional magic props that are involved. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not bringing out cards or coins or anything else, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if I was to present it like, you know, I've been memorizing the birthdays of celebrities, I said, do you mind, let, let's, you know, I'm gonna show off my memory skills to you right now, <laughs> right? And you go into that kind of a presentation, um, the spectator genuinely believes that you're not quote unquote doing magic. Mm. The moment of wonder is so much more powerful because you're catching them off guard, you yeah. know? And, and this is even an idea that's been explored on television shows where, you know, in the Carbonera effect, for example, when, you know, Carbonera is doing things for people that are just like customers in a shop and they don't know that he's doing magic for them, <laughs> right? So yes. yeah, um, and I think that that's one of the biggest differentiation factors in app magic in comparison to all the other forms of magic that are in the world. Is, that makes yeah, it's so well disguised because phones are so ubiquitous. Yeah, yeah, totally. You know? And so using it just seems so organic and natural, especially when you're using their phone and just saying to them, you know what, my, my phone's battery is almost out. Do you mind if we use yours? And you just proceed from there. 
That's so, yeah, that's so true. Yeah, I never looked at it that way, but you're completely right. Yes, <laughs> 100%. I mean, I, do you ever worry? I mean, you, you said earlier on that you've created 22 apps at this point. Yes. Do you ever worry that you're going to run out of ideas? Or have you got like a, I, I imagine that you've got a massive whiteboard with scrawl all over it and like lines and Zen diagrams and things like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. You're just like some mad professor's workshop. But do, do you know, that? because that's something that I've spoken to a lot of creators on this channel about. Mm -hmm. um, people that have created a lot of magic over the years, not necessarily app-based magic, but just magic in general. And And one thing that comes up again and again is that thought of, oh, you're only as good as your last product and what's going to happen if I run out of really good ideas and then, you know, I release a clunker and it's... Do you, <laughs> do, do, do you not worry about that? Do you, or, or is that something that's a concern for you? Yeah, oh, sure. I worry about it all the time. Um, there are a lot of ideas that I have that uh, we have not developed yet, a, a lot. Um, ideas that are very, very different from the ideas that I've developed currently, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, dramatically different <laughs> from like, things that I've developed currently. Um, and and we'll, I will be exploring those, you know, as time goes forward. So, uh, yeah, I don't think that there is an infinite number of good ideas. <laughs> you know, I really don't. I, I believe that it is a very finite number. And uh, I think that whoever jumps on those ideas first and in a market is who will succeed. Um, once in a while, I'm really surprised by these kinds of things. I'm, I'm surprised by people that create ideas that I would have never really imagined before. Um, but most of the time, when you look at the functionality of something like a phone and you say, okay, well, what are the core functions of a phone? And how can we exploit these functions for a magical kind of an effect? Yeah, there's a handful of stuff that pops out, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but yeah, you're right. I do actually have. Uh, not a whiteboard, but um, there are files that we have where there's a bunch of ideas that are written down. And, yeah, wow. We try to <laughs> implement them one at a time as we go along. Well, was, is Realist your latest app? Yes, yes, Realist So, is. So are we going to be seeing another app from you in 2022? Uh, hopefully, yes. Yeah, we are, um, in this particular case, we as Matt, Matt and I are currently in the development of a, a brand new idea that um, we are pretty certain we can do in 2022. In 2022, there are a couple of other priorities and, and that is the release of Inject 3, which is, people have been waiting for that forever. And we wanna be able to push that out. And we're very close to it actually now. Um, so that takes priority. But then right after that, once Inject 3 is kind of like settled into place, then um, I can look into the new product and, and get the new product developed. Um, and that's also important in general for business, you know, because, you know, I, I can't just rely on the sales of a couple of apps to keep me going. You know, I need new product <laughs> to come along. Yeah, and that's going to be fresh ideas and things that are different. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's... It's an ongoing thing. You know, that's one of the unique things about magic in general is that uh, magic is very, very fickle in that when you see a magician at an event, if that magician was to only do one trick that was amazing, to the spectator, they immediately say, well, what else do you have? <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? They want more. Yep. And yep. even when you show them more, if you were to go away from that event, and let's say you come back to similar clients, let's say a year down the line, they mm -hmm. want to see something new. They want to see something different you know, than what they've seen before. Yes. So magicians in general are like like comedians actually mm -hmm. we're forced to constantly come up with something new <laughs> you yeah, know it's true. what's new what's new uh, so it just keeps going let me ask you one more question about app magic as you're one of the leading experts when it comes to app based magic um i've spoken to a few people on the channel and they worry about what will happen. They're reluctant, not everybody, it's a very small percentage, but there's some people that are reluctant to make the jump into buying an app because they're worried about what will happen if the app stops being 
updated because obviously the thing with apps and i'm not an expert with apps and any stretch of the imagination but as far as i'm aware there's always going to be bugs that need fixing and so you always need to have a developer there you can't just it's not like uh okay so we talked off camera about my quantum deck it's not like the quantum deck where people buy the deck of cards and then that's it they've got it and nothing will stop that it's kind of like as the the developer has to be there in order to continue fix it, in order to make that app continue to work. And obviously about a year ago, we had Illusionist who famously withdrew support for some of their most famous apps and said, well, you know what? Thanks for buying them, but we're not going to support them anymore, right. which which was a, a big problem in the industry for the people that had bought those apps. Sure. And, and that's made people think twice about buying apps. Now, obviously, you are very committed to updating your apps uh, as are other developers like Lloyd Barnes and uh, uh, Mark Kirstein. Uh, but, but I mean, do you think it's an issue that there's more and more people developing apps now that are maybe not necessarily in it for the long term and they're developing an app that ultimately will end up not? Do you, do, do you yeah. see what I'm trying to say? I don't know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I totally agree with you. Um, I think in general, products have a lifespan. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if the product is a deck of cards or if the product is an app. And, and I, I agree that the lifespan oftentimes of an app can be shorter than the lifespan of a physical product. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, an app is just software. And the upkeep of it is the upkeep of the software that has to be done, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it, the same, but like, for example, I released a, uh, a deck that was called Cosmos 3. And it was really well received and the the entire order that i had from you know the u.s playing card company sold out and once it was sold out and once it was sold out i was like okay if i'm going to do this again then i'm going to have to buy a brand new set of thousands of decks <laughs> from the u.s playing card company to continue this and am i interested in making that investment in keeping this going and, and at that time i decided not to just because it's a lot of money to, to throw at all the cards you got to buy from them. So at the end, it's, it's just a money decision. You know, you, you look at what you're doing and it's like, okay, is it worth it to keep this up or not? Um, and I, I think that if apps were, you know, more being used more and there was more of a market for it, then the developers would not hesitate in constantly you know, keeping them up. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a, it's a challenge. <laughs> yeah. I can't yeah. lie. It, like I said, you know, you make something that works one day and Apple or Google makes a difference to the operating yeah. system. And now suddenly the next day it stops working. That sucks. Mm. <laughs> well, you know what? I've got, I've got one more question for you, which sure. is, is there anything le left within the magic industry that you want to achieve? What, I mean, what are your goals and aspirations over the next coming weeks and months and years and so on and so forth? Because you've achieved so much. Like I said at the beginning of this interview, you have completely changed the game when it comes to uh, when it comes to app-based magic. There's so many people that use your app. There's so many apps that connect with your app. It's just ridiculous. Um, and I know there's a lot of magicians who would really struggle if they didn't have injects available for them. So, you know, you could rest on your laurels, but I know you're not going to. What are your goals moving forward? Is there anything left on your magical bucket list that you haven't yet achieved? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, quite a bit. You know, I would love to develop hardware. Um, my background actually is in developing hardware. And uh, I would love to develop hardware for the magic market just because... Um, there is so much that really hasn't been done in uh, magic hardware, even though um, all of the major hardware vendors have done a brilliant job of creating great products. Um, but there's a lot of ideas that have not been explored. So that's, that's one of my first things that I would like to do within the magic market. Um, and then when it does come to app magic, once again, same thing, you know, um, there is, there are still um, quite a bit of art, you know, ideas that I really haven't been explored yet that that i would love to be able to release um, unfortunately a lot of the ideas that i've had in these last 13 years have been picked up by other developers you know so therefore <laughs> i can't do them anymore you know somebody else is doing them but that's okay that's that's fine that's just the way things work you know every, every creator in the world every inventor can say that you know oh, i had that idea darn it 
this other person got it <laughs> before I got a chance to really finish it. It must be very frustrating if that happens, though, and you've spent like potentially months or even years developing something similar. So you have an idea for something you spent maybe the best part of 18 months developing. I don't know if that's happened to you or not, but uh, you spent the best part of 18 months developing something. Then all of a sudden, another product hits the market that does something very similar with a, with a, with a normal magic trick. It's like, oh, well, you know. That's, that's the but apps take so much longer to produce and so much longer to flesh out it must yeah. be so frustrating it's like right damn it back to the drawing board yeah yeah that, that has actually happened yeah we, we made uh, an app that was based on siri uh and it was actually called get serious and this is something that practically nobody knows about you're the first person that actually that i've told this to um so get serious was an app that we developed randy and i developed it that was using siri as the mechanism for doing reveals and a bunch of other amazing pattern and things that you could do to interact with Siri. Um, and right before, we were really, really close to actually getting it done. Um, and right before that, there was, I believe, one other product that came out that later on turned into two products that were using Siri as their you know, way of producing outs and interactions with the phone. And we basically had to stop because they're like, okay, well, if we release this now, then people are going to say we're just copying this other guy over here, <laughs> you know, whereas we're not. We never knew the other product was even around. So, yeah, it happens. It happens a lot. Um, I'll give you another example of that, which is um, the uh, input methods, for example. You know, when I first came out, it had two input methods. You know, one of them was flipping the phone over. Mm -hmm. The other input method was the, the home screen, which at that time, Apple would call, they called it the springboard screens, right? right? And so the method is, how do you swipe on those screens? So when I originally came out with that idea, um, Chris Kenner's rising card app did not exist, right? And so literally a month before iForce was released, Chris Kenner released the Rising Card app, which had this method of swiping on the springboard as the input <sighs> method, <laughs> right? And that's just so frustrating. You're like, oh God. So now, you know, because you know that when people are going to download iForce and look at it, the first thought that's going to go through their minds like, oh yeah, you know, Rostami copied Chris Kenner. Like, no, I, I did not do that. You know, it's, it's got nothing to do with it. You know, That's really frustrating. <laughs> it is it's really frustrating, yeah. But it's just, like I said, it's the nature of the beast. Of, you know, the same way that Chris thought that swiping on your phone screen as you go from one page to the other seems like such a natural thing that you would do on the iPhone. And why not exploit that as a way of using it as an input method? I thought the same thing, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? It's the classic case of inventors just thinking of the same idea at the same time. What do you think the next big thing is in app magic? Like you talked about swiping on the screen to input methods. Obviously, Angelo's idea from uh, his very early app of using SMS. the yeah using using the uh, the the password thing has right. has been used by so many people. Obviously, it's, it's a very popular way of inputting. And then obviously, you've got pairing phones that inject, inject us so well. Where, you know, that was a huge game changer. What do you think the next big thing is? Because we've, we've been kind of living off the whole pairing phones for a while now. <laughs> right, you know. right. Um, uh, I think the next big, big thing is uh, a lot of products are using technology in such a hidden way where you don't even know that uh, any phone is even involved. Um, as a matter of fact, David Copperfield actually does an, a trick, which is like a book test where he's using technology as an index of looking up information that somebody just randomly picks up a book, you know, and they go to any page in a book and they look at the first word and David knows what word they're thinking of. You know, so, even though David Copperfield is not showing you that he has a phone in his hand, a phone is involved, the phone is hidden. And so therefore the phone is being used as an invisible assistant of a sort. Mm. You know, um, in the new version of Inject, we now have a feature which we call any card anywhere. 
And all, all it is, is whenever you think about doing memorized deck routines to do uh, any card in any number, you have to memorize the deck. And then you have to do math in your head to figure out how am I going to cut the deck so that the chosen card ends up in the chosen number, <laughs> right? So that's daunting to a lot of magicians. They're like, okay, what if we could just simply input that information and the app would tell you where you're supposed to cut the deck? So you didn't have to do all the mental gymnastics and everything else to derive that information. Now, so again, it's um, signs of how technology is being used in such an invisible way where there is absolutely no technology visible. You know, and wow. that's, yeah, some of the ways that it will move forward, you know. But at the same time, I, I think that the use of technology on the spectator's phone um, and having that use be motivated is going to continue. Yeah. Because when I do a routine where I'm asking someone, you know, let's look up the birthday of a celebrity, there is really no other method for the celebrity, for, for the spectator to know or to look up the birthday of a celebrity. Yeah. Google is the only way, yeah. you know? So this constant desire of coming up with the proper motivation and using the spectator's phone, I think is going to go on forever. Mm. Wow. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? If anybody who's is good at predicting future trends, it's you. You seem to, you seem to have always stayed one step ahead of everyone else, Greg. No, thank you. I try. <laughs> Do you have any plans to revisit normal magic tricks in the future i mean obviously you've brought out many routines over the years that have nothing to do with apps is all yeah. your creativity being thrown into apps or have you got something else coming down the line that's yeah yeah i do I actually the the new idea that we're working on right now um can be applied to a a, a book test um that doesn't even necessarily need technology you know, it, it's just a completely different idea in, um, what is that called? You know, in, in magic, there are these kind of like foundational methods, you know, so yeah. core methods that um, magicians exploit. And, and this new method that I've developed can be used in just a physical book. It doesn't have to be an app at all. Mm. You know, even though we probably will implement it as an app, but we don't have to. Um, and, and the same idea applies to the, the gimmick decks that I've made so far, you know, so for example, the Cosmos 3 deck is a typical magic trick. It's, it's, a, it's a gimmick deck of cards, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, so I love doing that. Sure. sure. I, I don't want to limit myself just to making app magic. I That's love every aspect of magic, you know. That's fantastic. It really yeah. is. It's fun. Well, you know what? This has been an incredible interview. Where can people buy your stuff? I mean, obviously... A lot of it's available in various different app stores, but do you have like a website where people can go and check out all the different trailers and, and, and things? Sure, sure. The, the easiest way of finding out about my products is just, just jumping on YouTube and just typing in my name. If you just type in Greg Rostami on YouTube, you'll find a variety of videos where I perform just a bunch of my different effects. Um, if you go onto the app stores, either the iOS app store or the Google Play store, and you type in my name or you type in Rostami Magic, you'll find my products there. Um, and thank goodness, uh, many of the products have links that are actually to video performances of it, so you can see them there. And they, they range in price. You know, uh, iForce, for example, is only $3. In the UK, I think it's as, it's as low as, I think like it's about, two pounds and maybe 40 pence or something like that. It's pretty, pretty inexpensive. Mm. And all the way at the top end of it, you know, of course there's inject, which currently sells for $80. Uh, but it does so yeah. much. It's like 15 apps in one. <laughs> yeah. 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 Inject actually has 22 tricks that it comes with and each and every one of them are stunning. And you mentioned wanting to get inject three out this year. Yes. What what will the improvements be in Inject Three? Can you? Shed oh some man, light on that? too many to name. <laughs> in every way imaginable, it's going to be better. Um, from a better user interface to uh, more effects that you know were impossible to do with Inject as it is currently. Um, it, it's going to incorporate technologies that we've been talking about over the last three or four years. Um, it's going to be the culmination of all these discussions that the community has had into a product that's going to make everybody's dreams come true. 
about Inject. Wow. <laughs> that sounds incredible. Yeah, yeah. It's a big project, but, you know, we're, we're almost done with it, actually. We're not that far away from it. That's amazing. That's fantastic. Yeah. This, this is, this is a, a fun story from the beginnings of Rostami Magic. And uh, when iForce first came out, um, I got an email from the producers of the television show in the UK, which is called The Gadget Show. And they told me, Greg, we have um, showcased iForce in our show that is got the, the theme of magic in it. So if you notice a spike in your sales, then it's because it was on television. <laughs> so then when I got the email, I was like really excited. Like, oh my God, you know, I'm gonna be on TV. <laughs> iForce is gonna be on TV. Um, and the time that they said in the UK that the show was gonna be on, um, Apple has this thing that you can actually see how well you're doing, you know, mm. as far as like your sales and, and it updates like hour by hour. <laughs> so I was sitting there looking at it. And so it was going that tick, 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 tick. And then the show comes on and then an hour later it goes, whoosh, <laughs> it shoots up to this like outrageously high number, you know, where I was selling like thousands and thousands and thousands of copies of iForce for like three or four days straight nonstop wow. um, and just because the producer of a show in the UK thought it'd be fun to show my app off you know um, and it's been and things like that have happened throughout you know my life as a creator a similar thing happened when iForce was uh, mentioned in the New York Times you know same situation huge spike um, and the as, as amazing as that spike was what made it a fascinating story was immediately afterwards, there were these one-star reviews that would say, oh, it sucks. And I, I'm, I couldn't figure it out. I'm like, why does the review say it sucks? And then uh, reviews started coming in that would say, I'm giving this one star because I don't want anybody else to find out about it. What? Okay, isn't that interesting? So, the customer recognizes that it's a magic trick, right? So because it's a magic trick, they don't want anybody else. And they recognize that because it's now become so popular and it's getting all these amazing five-star reviews that they want to push it down, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, and it's the most disheartening thing in the world to get these one-star reviews that in reality, the customer loves the product, but they don't want anybody else to have it, which is something that magicians experience all the time. Like, you know what? This is so good that I don't want anybody else to have it. I want to be the only one that's performing it. That's crazy. It's crazy. It is. Man, how did yeah, you do that? Imagine that emotion that happens within the magic community happening in the realm of hundreds of thousands of people. That's outside of the magic community. That's watching a television show, right? And that's what I experienced for several weeks. And, and that experience became so fascinating that when I reached out to David Pope from the New York Times, he thought that story was so interesting that he wrote an article about my experience of getting one-star reviews. Wow. Yeah. That's so, mad. It's mad. <laughs> that's, wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, that's, that's one of the many fun facts about, you know, being on a television show with a product that everybody can afford at three bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, iForce is amazing. I didn't realize it was so cheap because I must have bought it about 10 years ago. So I don't, <laughs> I didn't realize it's so cheap, but I mean, it's, it's still to this day it serves a purpose that's absolutely perfect that no other apps do you know that the, the, there's so many different ways that i ever used it over the years it's great oh thank you thank you and and outside of your website uh, can people connect with you what's the best social media to reach out to you on um i am uh, on facebook quite a bit um i even even though i do have like an instagram account i'm not as much on Instagram or Twitter or those other platforms. Uh, but if anybody like messages me on Facebook, um, I'll try to respond to them. There's a, Inject has like, I think about 9,000 customers. So there's a lot of people that are trying to 
talk to me <laughs> all the time, <laughs> you know, wow. but that's okay. I, I, I try my best to address as many people as I can. Mm. Yeah. But that's, Facebook is probably the best way. Okay. That's amazing. You know what, Greg, this has been a really, really fun interview. And I want to say one more time, thank you so much for coming along and, and, and chatting with me. You really are changing the game in every single way. And, and one thing that shone through in this interview is how passionate you are about your customers, your customer experience, and developing magic that people can use. It's not just pipe dreams. You can tell that you really want to give people a product that they care about, that they want to use, and it's, it's shining through. So thank you so much for sharing your passion here and coming and joining me on Talk Magic. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Craig. Thank you for having me. And this was amazingly fun. Yeah. You're more than welcome. I want everybody who's watching this interview to reach out to Greg. And if you haven't already, go buy some of his stuff. Realist, full the pants off me. My entire phone is just full of your apps. I've got everything. <laughs> even even yeah, it, it, the one app that I haven't, I downloaded it, but didn't really much do much with it was realist and that was the one that you rang me on and then just fooled the pants off me with and so now i'm gonna to have to go back and I, i've already got it on my phone i'm gonna to have to go back and and really study that it's 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 incredible so greg one more time my friend thank you so much yeah you're, you're my pleasure thank you thanks guys leave a comment down below i'm sure greg will see it so leave a comment down below let me know what you think of the interview buy all of his stuff and i'll be back again tomorrow with another video greg thanks very much Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.